afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Chat from the Old Cap, a program produced and sponsored by the UI Center for Advancement that shares the very best of the University of Iowa with our alumni, friends, and the world. I am your host, Jeff Lieberman. Before we get into today's program, we do want to recognize a big University of Iowa news event that happened just this week. Willard Sandy Boyd, the 15th president of the University of Iowa, died this week at 95 years old. Our thoughts are with his wife, Susan, their children, and the entire Boyd family. Those of us who had the chance to work with Sandy will always remember the experience. And those of you who are paying attention here or are ever impacted by the University of Iowa will always benefit from his kindness, generosity, and leadership. Sandy, you will be missed. Today's guest is screenwriter and producer Rick Cleveland. Rick is an Ohio native that after undergraduate school started his career on the stage before moving to the role as writer and producer. He was with the Second City Improv Troupe in Chicago and founded the American Blues Theater also in Chicago. Rick came to the University of Iowa to attend the Playwriters Workshop in our Department of Theater and he graduated with his MFA in 1995. His Record speaks for itself. He's worked in film, features like Runaway Jury, but has really made his marks in television. He has worked as a producer and a writer on some of the most recognized and recognizable programs in the last 25 years. Programs, shows like The West Wing, Six Feet Under, Mad Men, Nurse Jackie, House of Cards, Archer, and The Man in the High Castle. Good afternoon, Rick Cleveland. Thank you for joining us. Rick, I think you're muted there. There I am. Hey, there you are. Hey, Sorry about that. No, no, no. It's it's uh it's great to see you. Take two, as they say, we can go with that. So thanks for joining us today, Rick. Thanks for having me. Um, Rick, we're, we'll have the today's discussion happen in uh, three couple of uh, a couple three parts here. One is your time at the University of Iowa. Then we'll move into your career, and then we'll wrap up with a Q and A session at the end of the program. Um, Rick, tell us a little bit. How did you get to the University of Iowa? Um, how did I get there? Well, uh, probably by way of Chicago. Um, I. Uh, was really inspired uh, by Saturday Night Live as as a well. I was inspired in high school by Kurt Vonnegut, and I still remember. I had a lot of teachers who uh, were educated at Kent State University and were there when the shootings happened, and the governor called out the National Guard, and four students were killed. And and so it, in the seventies, in the late seventies, when I was in high school, we had a class called. Um, literature of social criticism where we read like every book by Kurt Vonnegut and Abby Hoffman steal this book and Dalton Trumbo's Johnny Got His Gun and I remember reading in the foreword or introduction to um, Slaughterhouse-Five Kurt Vonnegut mentioned the University of Iowa and and that's it sort of stayed in my brain for the longest time but in any case I, I chased uh after the Saturday Night Live cast by going, you know, by auditioning and taking classes at Second City. There's an improv cabaret theater. It's not so much uh, um, a style of acting, but it's, uh, as I was later told by one of the exec producers, Bernie Salins, it's, it's a method to teach uh, actors how to write. Um, so, after doing, you know, improv for three or four years, I started to write plays in, in a very, you know, blossoming theater scene in Chicago. And I started a theater company, American Blues Theater, and I had a lot of uh, success. I was locally renowned, I guess you might say. And, and then um, I decided to um, apply to the workshop and I got in, I got an Iowa Arts Fellowship and that's how I got to Iowa. What are some of your favorite memories of campus? 
Uh, well, I loved, I lived way out on Dodge Street by Hickory Hill Park. And I had um, a couple weeks after I got to Iowa, I adopted uh, a golden retriever dog, a puppy named Sherlock. He came with that name. And, um, and so a lot of my memories are of just being with Sherlock. And, and that dog, um, you know, was with me the day I met my wife you know, in 1995. And my kids all were born while he was still with us. And um, they all climbed all over him. A golden retriever is a great dog for babies to climb on because <laughs> they just have the greatest temperament. Um, so most of my memories are about, about Sherlock and Hickory Hill, Hickory Hill Park and and even taking him into classrooms. But I have a fond, a lot of fond memories of the people that um, that I was in the playwrights workshop with and some of my teachers and um, the the plays that I worked on and the and the the other plays the other playwrights that I watched their work being read and staged. Um, I have a lot of fond memories. Iowa's the place I've lived pretty much everywhere, and Iowa's the one place uh, that I miss. That's good to hear. It's good to hear, and I know you've been you've been back recently, and we'll we'll talk about that talk about that later. Um, what. When you came here, because you said you were inspired by Vonnegut, among among others, and by the way, that might be one of the headiest high school reading lists I've ever heard. Um, far far different than 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 many many courses. But um, what what surprised you about coming to the University of Iowa and the graduate program? Well, what surprised me was. Uh, how many writers there were in Iowa? Like, like uh, uh, you know, the you know, clerk behind the ice cream counter was a probably an MFA poet, or you know, I mean, everybody was a writer. Uh, that's what surprised me more than anything. Um, uh, yeah, and and somebody told me that it that it's one of the most uh, highly educated populaces in the in the United States. Like, mm -hmm. you know not even counting the students that are there now, but people stay mm -hmm. in Iowa, they don't leave. And I can certainly understand that. What about your student experience here? In addition to uh, your golden retriever and starting your family, what about your student experiences were most meaningful to you? Um, gosh, uh, I had, I just had a great time in the classes. You know, it, it was studying for my MFA was pretty, pretty much allowed me just to write a lot. And that was like the first time when I was just dedicating myself to writing something new every semester, whether it was a play script or a film script, mostly it was plays, monologues. I do uh, first person monologues myself. Um, and and the, the teachers that I had, Lainey Robertson, um, Art Brecca, uh, just anybody that in, that took my work as seriously as I did, uh, re really, really mattered to me. What was your project, your MFA project? Uh, it was a it was a monologue play about a disastrous trip to Africa that I took um, in the in 1989. I went there for a magazine assignment for Outside Magazine, and I I went into the bush in Luangwa National Park in Zambia. And um, I followed an anti-poaching patrol around for like three days. And uh, I got shot at by poachers with AK-47s and chased by a hippopotamus. Um, and I got amoebic dysentery. And it was like one of the worst trips I ever took. But it was also, uh, you know, fodder for the storytelling machine. <laughs> yeah, we, and we'll talk about some things as we move into your career about basing stuff and life experience. But um, I, I don't know that you're the first person I know that's been shot at, but you are the first person I've ever met that's been chased by a hippo. So uh, another, <laughs> bo another box to check off. Uh, let, let, let's move now I into your career. And, and we were talking earlier, um, you, you're so well known for dramatic writing. But your roots are in comedy and humor, whether it's Second City or even practicing writing scripts. 
Yeah, I you know the first scripts you, you you couldn't buy them like you can buy them now or find them online. There was no online, so uh, you know. And I, I was such a Monty Python fan that I would type the this I would type their sketches out on my mom's electric typewriter, um, just so I could see what a script looked like, uh, and 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 so I was just I was hungry to see you know what the, what the written format for movies and television shows were and there there weren't a lot of places to go back then um, there were I think the first book of movie scripts that I saw published was William Goldman's um, Adventures in the Screen Trade and I think like the Sundance Kid Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and the Marathon scripts were in that book I think or in one of his other books but. Um, but that was already after, you know, I didn't trip over those scripts until I already knew that I wanted to write for film and television. And aside from we, before the show, we were talking and being influenced by Smothers Brothers, Steve Martin. Uh, we mentioned uh, the Pythons, uh, a couple of others. Who else influenced you in, in writing style or aspiration? George Carlin, uh, Richard Pryor. Um, Gosh, any Firesign Theater, um, any, a, a lot of stand-up comics, like, you know, even current stand-up comics, in, you know, uh, everybody that's ever been on Saturday Night Live, um, a lot of the Brits, The Goon Show, Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, uh, Preston Sturgis was an influence, Woody Allen, although, you know, now that's kind of shameful to say, I guess. Mm -hmm. And Peter Benchley, like um, uh, anybody that that you know wrote, uh, or you know, and, and Robert Benchley, Peter Benchley's I think uncle who wrote humor, and Peter Benchley wrote Jaws. Like I fell in love, uh, w you know, early on. There was a guy I saw his name on two movies, Carl Gottlieb. He was on Jaws. He was a screenwriter for Jaws, and on The Jerk. And I felt like. I got to know who this guy is because he wrote one of the scariest movies I've ever seen and one of the funniest movies I ever seen. And I really, you know, I'm Facebook friends with him now, but um, it took me quite a while to be able to, you know, back in those days, like I said, there was no internet. So you couldn't really track these people down to write them fan letters. Well, and there's such a brilliance in, in comedy writing too, about the, the quick hit um, Mitch Hedberg, you know, is, these little two sentence oh, yeah. things. And it's the most profound stuff you can, you can think of. And it's like, how did you do that in 16 words? Right. Yeah. A lot of people don't talk, you know, there, there's a, a, a brilliant British comedian named Stuart Lee. And he talks about uh, comedy, stand up comedy and writing. And I, I worked with a, a really, you know, a really smart stand-up comedian from Australia, Jim Jeffries, and I did the first season of his show, Legit for FX, and he's never written a word that he says on stage down on paper, but he's still writing, like he's still writing, even though he's not putting pen to paper by just doing the same routines over and over again and shaping them and editing them and retooling them and you know, I, you know, it took me almost a year to convince him that what he was already doing was writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we talked about your influences, but now how do you actually get started? You graduate Iowa in 95. What happens next? Uh, well, I, I, I met, there was an alumnus who was visiting the campus, Barry Kemp, who uh, was in the Playwrights Workshop. And he, um, he wrote for the, uh, the, the Bob Newhart show, the one set in the end, not the shrink mm -hmm. show. He wrote for Taxi and he saw me do my, um, a, a little excerpt from my MFA thesis piece. My, it was called Skinny White Boy in the Heart of Darkness. And he saw me do a bit of that and he offered me a job. So I, I left a semester early and I had an, an office on the Universal lot in his building, Bungalow 78, it was called. And I had a parking space with my name on it. I remember telling friends, you know, that I have a parking space with my name on it. And they were like, is it spray painted or is it screwed on? I was like, well, it's screwed on. And they said, well, make sure you take that before you leave because you, you know, you, you'll be replaced. But so I have that somewhere. I have my old parking space name. name was, that when he, 
Was that when he was working on coach? Was that in production at the time? I sat in on the coach writer's room a few times and I just, you know, I didn't, as much as I loved comedy, I didn't really, I didn't really get sitcoms, you know, I didn't quite understand how they worked. Um, and I don't think I would have lasted, you know, five minutes in a, in a proper sitcom room. Like, like it's pretty cutthroat and, and, uh, and I, I'm just not sure I would have had the temperament for it. So what was your first toe in the water in dramatic television? Well, I adapted a play of mine that I wrote in Iowa. It was called Tom and Jerry, but then it became a film. And when something, you know, they don't, people don't pay attention to the titles of plays so much, but when you have a film called Tom and Jerry, you get a cease and desist letter from Warner Brothers the people that own the cat and the mouse and you have to change the title. So it got changed to Jerry and Tom, um, but it went to Sundance and Miramax bought it. And so once I got some good reviews and variety and, and, um, and, and, and so that enabled me, that enables uh, a television producer uh, named Barry Sonnenfeld and Alex Gonza, who created the Homeland series on Showtime um, to hire me to write for a show called Maximum Bob, which was kind of like a, a, a dramedy uh, based on a book by Elmore Leonard. And that was my first toe in the in the door of writing for television. Well, and it was it was a big opening in, in that door too, because I mean we we'll talk about some of the individual programs or our characters later, but we mentioned them at at the top of the top of the show. When you look back on, on everything that you've done, what makes you the most proud? Professionally, um, personally, I'm proudest that, I, that I've been married to, for 25 years to the same woman and I have three kids who are grown and just finished college. Uh, professionally, uh, there's a couple of things I, I, I love that I, that I got to write for all five seasons of a show called Six Feet Under. Um, I'm proud of, of the, the Emmy that I won for an episode of The West Wing that I co-wrote with Aaron Sorkin. And I'm probably most proud of the solo performance award that I won um, at the HBO Aspen Comedy Festival in 2007. And as we were talking earlier, that's available on YouTube. Look up. Rick Cleveland Aspen Comedy, and yeah. you can find it. So I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm personally looking forward to seeing that. I haven't seen that yet. Um, we could go through each of these landmark television programs, sort of season by season, or even character by character. But there's there's themes that start to emerge on all of these, and the way that a lot of your programming has impact popular culture and even society. A couple of weeks ago when we met, we were talking about the, the dichotomy of the West Wing in the early 2000s and House of Cards comes along 15 or 20 years later. I, I think our audience would love to hear that story. Well, it, it, when I first told my agents that I wanted to go to work on the West Wing, you know, it had, hadn't premiered yet. I'd seen the pilot uh, and I loved it. And they, you know, they told me they didn't think it was going to work. Um, they didn't think the show was going to last long. That it might not be a good choice on my part. And the reason why they thought that was because Bill Clinton was in office at the time and he was embroiled in the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And, and everyone in Hollywood wrongly assumed that the show was going to be about that, that it was going to have that kind of tone. It was going to be about a scandal ridden presidency, but it wasn't. It was it was the exact opposite. It was a Frank Capra-esque, idealized look at the hardworking people in the West Wing. So I think that's why that show struck a chord with people, you know, as much as it did. It was a cure to the real life politics in Washington. And 12 or 13 years later, when House of Cards started, um, Obama was into his second term and as much hope and inspiration as we all felt during that first term, it started to wear off. And 
the, the summer that we were writing the show was the first summer since 1995 that uh, Congress shut um, the government down. Um, and so people were feeling ripe, I think, uh, or hungry maybe a little bit for something more satirical, something that had a, a darker, more cynical message or tone. And, um, and, and that's sort of like, you know, I mean, in a lot of ways, House Cards was the anti West Wing. Mm -hmm. your, your shows have always been so character driven. I mean, I, I think about, I can't think of one character that was ancillary or extra that didn't play a, a, an important role either in the series or in that specific episode. Do you have a favorite character or characters for whom you've written? I loved writing for Ruth in Ruth Fisher on Six Feet Under. But there, there's a character, there's one character that I created for Mad Men. Um, and he was uh, a controversial shock comic from you know, fictional named Jimmy Barrett, um, played by uh, Patrick Fischler. And um, he did a couple of epi episodes, but he was my concoction. And I, I always felt like I, I could have built a series around him. You know, he right. was a guy who like modeled very much after Don Rickles, who was kind of like an insult comic and, and very politically incorrect, you know, before there was such a thing as political correctness. And there was just something about a, a character who who, who has very low impulse control that I really enjoyed writing. Well, you know, I can never eat a bag of Utz potato chips without thinking of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, we, we talked about the, the Jimmy Barrett character. Are there others that could have spun off and become their own show? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think about some of the characters that, that I created for pilot scripts that didn't get made and, and sort of, you know, mourn those lives <laughs> um, that they didn't, that audiences didn't get to meet them. Um, but I, I don't know about spinoff characters. It's funny, there's, there's, a, there's a weird credit that a writer can get for creating a character and you can get an actual paycheck for creating a character. And I've, I've never, I, I'm not sure that I've ever worked on a show, even though I've created like a number of characters for different series. I don't know that I've ever gotten a character payment. I'm going to have to agent into that. Well, we can use this program as a launch point for that next, that next piece of uh, piece of research is it, the, the shows that we've been talking about big casts, um, is it different writing for a large cast than maybe a show where there's two or three main characters and others just kind of come and go? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, with a large cast, you, you end up um, soloing characters uh, or siloing characters in small groups so that you can write manageable scenes between two and three characters. And so you don't get a, a lot of opportunities. Like if you, if you have a cast of a, a dozen characters or more, um, that you have a lot of characters who never cross paths with other characters in the series. Um, so, I mean, I personally, I, I, I enjoy, you know, I enjoy writing for smaller ensemble shows. Um, so there's just something about it that, you know, you just, you have the opportunity to dig deeper and, and have more fun. Is there a stress in the writer's room when you have a big, uh, a big cast to sort of keep things balanced? Like West Wing, boy, we haven't done a Toby show in three episodes. No, I that that, that never came up in uh, on West Wing, and um, it's funny, but I think like the writers develop an affinity for some uh, for other for some characters and not so much for others. And, and most of the time it has everything to do with the actor playing them. So if you have a character that's played by a, a pro, an actor who is, is difficult to work with, you, you tend to fall out of love with that character and not want to spend much time with them. 
So that happens. Very, very real world, real world a, a example. The, the progress of storytelling in television has changed so much since uh, I mean, you're part of the HBO group that really with shows like Six Feet Under launched a completely different ability to share a story arc, long form, char deep character development back to network television with West Wing, but still that that same. Um, but at the same time, you've got these shows that are longer and, and fragmented. Is it harder to get an audience for those shows rather than just having the, the, the three networks where I can watch beginning and end in 50 minutes? Yeah, the, my uh, episode of the West Wing in Excelsis Deo, um, over 20 million people watched it on its first airing. And, and those numbers are unheard of now, you know, on streaming shows. And so al although it's, I'm sure there's far more original content now, you know, not just on basic cable, premium cable, the original, you know, three or four networks and all the streamers now, um, it's, it's really hard for a show to stand out or for people like I can think of a half a dozen shows that uh, that I've watched and loved in the last couple of years that I don't think most people would have even heard of. Can you give us some examples? Well, I just saw a show that's on Amazon this year called The English that I, I love. I just think it's fantastic. I think it's a BBC import. Um, so I don't know that it's I don't know if Amazon produced it or not. There was an, an Amazon show called The Patriot uh, mm -hmm. back in 2014, 2015 that I absolutely loved. I think it only lasted two seasons. Um, there was a show on HBO Max called Years and Years uh, that I loved. A BBC show, lasted, BBC show lasted one season. There's a show from, I think, Norway that was on HBO Max called The Foreigners that's only had two seasons also on HBO Max. Um, I, you know, I, I would, there was a, a show called Godless on Net Netflix that I'm sure a lot of people are completely unfamiliar with. That was the Scott Frank's show before he did Queen's Gambit. Um, so I think it's just so much harder to, to m make an impression with a television show now because there are just so many of them. You, you and I grew up at about the same time, we almost identically the same time. And when we talk about making impressions on, on society and in different things, because of the audience size, um, a character like Jed Bartlett would become sort of national fabric. You know, a lot of people knew who he was. Um, I think a lot of people thought Martin Sheen was the president at, at the time. Yeah. And, then you, and then you fast forward where maybe people know that Kevin Spacey's playing the president, but they don't know Frank Underwood or, or those types of things. How do shows become part of our, sort of our societal fabric? Or can they? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they do. I think they still can. They, they have to somehow speak to or capture the zeitgeist. You know, they have to sort of appear at the right moment. I think, you know, Breaking Bad was a show that I think it's weird. I think, it, you know, Breaking Bad was an AMC show and I, I was with it from episode one. Uh, but I don't think a lot of people were until it, it went into syndication while it was still in first run uh, premiere on AMC. It went into syndication on Netflix. So people who had missed its first couple of seasons could binge watch it and then catch up to the final season, at which point everyone was watching it, you know, as it unfurled for the, la for the final season. And I think that without Netflix, uh, we, if I was talking about Breaking Bad, half of this audience wouldn't know what I was talking about mm -hmm. if Netflix hadn't played that role um, in, in allowing people to binge it. Um, if it had just been, you know, on AMC, um, without constant reruns or being able to play, being able to, to watch it whenever you wanted to watch it, uh, it wouldn't have had the success that it had. Does, does the, the binge concept or how does it, the binge concept, 
play a role in thinking about production. So say if you're doing the West Wing network television at the time, you know, you're working for a series of weeks and shows are sort of being released over the, you know, fall and spring versus, oh, if we're going to dump this all at once, it's going to be a year and a half to produce it. And now nobody's going to see it for maybe two years, new episodes. Does that, does that play into either production or writing character development? Uh, I, um, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I know a lot of writers would say that it absolutely does, that that it, it creates a big difference. But I still like, for instance, I just watched all, the second season of White Lotus on HBO. And I think it's better than the first season. And, 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 and I watched that show every Sunday night, the way I used to watch The Sopranos or The Wire, anticipating, can't wait till next week's episode, you know? And when you binge something, you, you know, you, you don't have that Monday morning water cooler moment where you're talking with your friends or coworkers about last night's episode, because, but at the same time, you're, you're watching an episode of something. And then if it ends on a great cliffhanger, you want to click the next episode right away. Do you want to watch one more? Do you want to watch one more? Do you want to watch? And you end up watching, you know. I can't tell you how many times my wife and I have like binged something in two days, you know, Mm -hmm. if it was great. Um, But it's that same anticipation that, you know, you can watch something and binge it. You're not dealing with that delayed gratification that you have to deal with, like with HBO shows. Um, But you still want to, you know, you still want everybody to watch the next episode as much as you want them to watch, you know, the episode they're watching now. So I don't know if that, if, if it actually changes structurally, um, you know, the ep- episodic television. I mean, I know that it's, television didn't used to be as serialized as it was until I st- got it onto the scene, until I sort of, till my generation started writing for television on shows like West Wing and, and Sopranos and Six Feet Under. Um, they were more episodic so that you could, if you say tuned into The Incredible Hulk with Bill Bixby, it was kind of the same episode every week. He wandered into a new town, got a job as a you know, clerk in a bookstore or a dishwasher at a restaurant, met a pretty girl, met a bad guy or a bully, you beat up the Hulk, beat up the bully, and then he'd have to leave town to go somewhere else. Every episode was deliciously the same, right? Um, and that's not the case. And that hasn't been the case in, you know, decades, right? Um, other than a certain except- cable channel that produces Christmas movies. But other than that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, on order show, right? Mm-hmm. But it's interesting you mentioned that with, uh, for example, The Sopranos, um, Mitchell Burgess and Robin Green, I follow Iowa graduates who uh, worked on that show as writers and producers. They told me once years ago that, Sopranos was among the first shows to have characters drive plot versus to have plots with characters in them. Yeah. And, and and I loved that show too, because they they could also, they could also give real estate to characters who uh, were maybe, you know, C list characters or something that weren't the main characters you could, you know, and one of the scripts that those guys wrote, the Pine Barrens, um, is like, you know, one that everybody remembers. It's just Pauly and, uh, and Michael Imperial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Christopher tr- looking for a place to bury a dead Russian mobster. Who might not be dead. Who might not be dead. And it, and it sort of plays like an Abbott Costello routine, you know? It's very funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that whole episode was pretty much that story. And, and that was pretty, you know, that sort of taught us at Six Feet Under that you could sort of break, you could break the rules of narrative structure a little bit and give, you know, give one character like a huge story and give everyone else a smaller piece of the story telling pie. You're participating today in an edition of Chat from the Old Cap. It's a production of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement that focuses on the UI and it's available for alumni, friends, and anybody around the world. Rick Cleveland is our guest today. We're talking about his experiences at the University of Iowa and his career in television and film production.
And Rick, a couple of weeks ago, when we were preparing for this program today, you talked about a, uh, a documentary that is now appearing on CNN and it's called Tis the Season and it focuses on entertainment, uh, programming, television, movies, and how they deal with the holidays, the Christmas holidays in some ways. And you, you sent us a clip where you told a, a very personal story that was rolled into your Emmy award-winning episode of The West Wing. Would you share that with us? Yeah, I, um, my, my dad was a Korean War vet, a decorated Korean War vet, and he, um, uh, he passed away uh, of, he, he, had a, he had a rough life. The Korean War, I think, impacted him in a really uh, terrible way. And he was mostly homeless, living in a flop house when he died. After we buried him, I found out that I could have had him buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And I went to Washington um, for the opening of the Korean War Memorial. Everybody knew about the Vietnam War Memorial, the wall, it's famous. It was seen in the movie Born on the Fourth of July. Everybody knows it. Um, but not everybody knows about the Korean War or its memorial. So I, I went to see it in DC and I bought like a gift book for the Korean War Memorial and while I was there. And the first week that we were meeting on the West Wing as a writing staff, I gave that book to the produce, executive producer, director, Thomas Schlamme. And I said, just like in case you're ever tempted to shoot a scene on the mall at the Vietnam War Memorial, here's a pitch for another memorial that is really interesting and impactful. And I gave him the book and he said, well, why do you, you know, give a rip about this? And so I told him about my dad and he said, that's an episode. Like, so we've, we figured out, a you know, a, a way to, you know, we had a, a homeless vet in that episode passed away at the Korean War Memorial and he had a coat on that was um, donated by Richard Schiff's character, Toby Ziegler. And inside that coat was his, uh, an old White House ID card. So when they found this guy's, you know, this deceased veteran, they called Toby and Toby can't help himself but get involved in, in, in this man's death. Um, the more he find out, finds out about him, the, the, the more he, you know, gets involved and he winds up uh, getting him buried in, in Arlington. And so it was a little bit of like poetic wish fulfillment on my part, but it also taught me a really valuable lesson. And that is, you know, a friend of mine, an actor, Evan Handler, told me that the most important story you'll ever write is your own. And I got to say, like, I, I didn't even really think about it at the time, even while I was writing that episode, that I was writing something that was, uh, you know, deeply personal to my life. Like, I, I was just, uh, you know, it was like probably the first time I, I, I dug that deep. Uh, and it happened to be for an episode of The West Wing. Um, and um, it, it's, you know, it's stuck with me for that reason. And so CNN asked me to talk about the episode um, in their Tis the Season documentary. And, and I told that story. Well, thank you for sharing that here. And, and thanks to your dad for, for his service and, and sacrifice. And uh, watching the clip, even to these, this day, 20 some years later, um, beautifully written and wonderfully shot just visually. It's an amazing piece, amazing piece of, of art. So, so thank you for that. Um, we've got a few questions flowing into the Q&A section, and we'll get to those in, uh, in just about five minutes. But I want to uh, wrap up a little bit more about the, the coming back to Iowa City part. You, you mentioned you, you've missed it here, and we've missed having you. But you spent some time with us uh, on campus this fall and with our students. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I got to teach a, a class that we call The Room, and it was basically a TV pilot writing class. And there's a fellow, a postgraduate fellowship attached to it. Um, so I worked uh, individually with, with uh, three other fellows um, 
along with the almost, I don't know, 14, 15 writers, young writers in, in the classroom itself. And um, everybody had to develop a pilot project in that in that class. And it was um, it, it was it, I had a blast. I, I don't if if people had as much fun, half as much fun as I did, then 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 I think it was a resounding success. But I, I had a great time. What when you were looking at their work or their ideas, were you saying like, I've seen this before and they saw I can do it? Or is this a new West Wing you're trying to? pitch me or a new six feet under or what kind of genres or styles were they working with that you know people were all over the map some one writer had like a very short subject animated you know very sort of surreal animated project that is unlike anything I've ever seen um and so I I didn't I really wanted people to follow their hearts I didn't want them to try and you know write for the marketplace so to speak um, cause that's a beast that no one succeeds in chasing. Um, nobody ever catches it. So I just wanted people to, you know, I think that the strongest thing that you can leave the university of Iowa with, if you're a writer is a sample that, that shows your voice, um, to be distinct and unusual. Uh, I think that's, the, that's the, you know, the best way the only way I know to get to any level of success as a writer. Let's go to some of the questions that are in the Q and A section right now. And um, one of the people joining us today is curious to know about some of the I other writers with whom you worked with at Iowa. Uh, well, I, I worked with Lisa Schlesinger, who uh, who teaches the Playwrights Workshop now. We were in workshop together. Uh, I, I uh, also uh, I worked with Keith Huff, who is a good buddy of mine. We did House of Cards together. Um, he was in the workshop with me. He wrote on Mad Men as well. And he, he wrote a, a play um, called A Steady Rain with Daniel Craig and Hugh Jackman on Broadway. Um, and I worked with a writer named Richard Strand, who's just a really nifty, smart, crafty playwright. Um, you know, I, uh, who else? I worked with a graduate director named Mark Hunter, who I, who I loved. He directed a couple of pieces of mine, plays of mine. Um, does that answer the question? It does. It does. Oh, there, oh yeah. I'm trying to think that's, that I didn't know very, I didn't really know anyone from other workshops. Mm-hmm. How would you, you mentioned um, working with the students and, and finding their own voice. How would you recommend somebody physically get started on in the profession? Is it still load up a car and drive to California or what's the first step? Well, I, you know, if I have a concern, if I have a concern about young writers, it's that, well, look, pre-internet, I knew who Preston Sturgis was even though he had been dead, you know, for decades before I was born. Um, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I noticed that uh, there were quite a few students who, who if, I, if I asked them even about Quentin Tarantino's first scripted movie, True Romance, they had no idea what I was talking about. And I know that movie is 30 years old now, but I think, if you want to write for television or for film or for whatever medium it, you want to write for, you have to know as much as possible about the people who came before you because you're standing on their shoulders. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you, you know, if you want to be a comedy writer, you, you, you owe it to yourself to know everything you can learn about you know, the great comics that came before you or the great comedic writers that came before you. Um, and it, it, it's astonishing to me that, you know, that, it, that I, you know, nope, I don't know if anyone in my class knew who Norman Lear was. Wow. Which, which I think is sh shocking. Now, Norman just turned 100. So I get it, you know, I mean, I get it. But, um, I, I don't know, maybe it's social media or something, but I don't, um, 
or it's attention span. And I also know students are, you know, they're not just taking my class, they're busy, busy, busy with, you know, seven other projects. And, um, but, but I sometimes, you know, wonder if people are immersing themselves in the, you know, in, in the history of the medium that they're trying to break into. Well, your, your reference to Norman Lear is, is, is so apt. And that's one of the things I was thinking about when we were talking about spinoffs earlier, that not only was it great television and popular, long-running, successful television, but every series, whether it was All in the Family, Maud, Jefferson's, Good Times, everything kind of changed how we thought about society and how people think, think and act. It just wasn't, I got lucky with six pieces of fluff. Yeah, you know, um, th there's an episode of All in the Family called The Draft Dodger um, that I talked about in that CNN piece. And one of the things that people didn't know was that Jimmy Carter was just in office. And when that episode, six months after that episode aired, uh, Carter signed the amnesty law, mm -hmm. letting all those draft dodgers who were in Canada come home. Mm -hmm. And that that episode of television had something to do with that, you know, it, it, it was, it was part, part of the pop culture, culture dialogue, I guess, but it became a part of the political dialogue and it resulted in something really, you know, in a policy change that was really, really crucial and important. So uh, uh, along those lines of knowing, of knowing history, sort of a, a two-part question some of your favorite shows that you were growing up or maybe favorite characters or even a specific episode of a favorite show. And then if one of our students came to you and, and, and said, Rick, I, I need some advice. I, I need to go where to look to learn. Where would you send them? To, for, for breaking into television? No, I'm sorry, for learning the history. When we were talking about like, go study Norman Lear or go study... Um, you know, go study Bonanza yeah, or, or whatever, Quincy or yeah. whatever it may be. I, I think that, you know, you can watch almost anything online and you can go, the Museum of TV and Film has like a huge library that's open to anybody that wants to, you know, plug into it. I, don't, I think it's free even. Um, there's just like n nothing that you can't find online today, you know? Um, you just have to... You just have to dig. Do you have a personal favorite show or character or episode? Um, I, I really loved The Wire. You know, I'm 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 from er, earlier in my life. I would probably say Mash probably meant the most. And and the first episode that I saw that it was a it was a doc it was a faux documentary of the MASH unit. And it was the, it was the only episode ever done without a laugh track. In black and white. Yeah. And I loved that episode because it showed me, you know, long before, I mean, cause it, it took years for people to get rid of the laugh track, right. Before we had single camera comedy, but it was almost like a preview of what single camera comedy would look like. And that's very much in my wheelhouse. Um, I, I don't understand the laugh track. Comedy that requires track. <laughs> it, it, I don't if I, get. If I remember right, and somebody out there might be able to check me, I think it was an Iowa grad who invented the laugh track. Oh, or or had a role maybe. in it back, like in the early 1960s when television was going from live to the studio, and they thought that people needed the cue to laugh. And I might I might have that wrong, but I think there's a University of Iowa connection to your laugh track. Oh, maybe. Well, I'm not going to send hat hatred at that person. But. <laughs> well, Rick, I, I, I tell you, uh, we, we really enjoyed having, having you with us. Um, it was a great to spend the last 45 minutes or so with you coming up uh, on the hour. But more so, thank you for what you do for the University of Iowa, taking the time to give back to our students, participate and what's going on on campus and on a larger scale, thank you and congratulations on your professional work because you have left a legacy here. You have provided those shoulders uh, 
on which others will stand as the media moves forward. So we're grateful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And it honestly, it wouldn't have happened without uh, me being in Iowa the first time. Well, we're grateful. And when you and I see each other, maybe we'll run the script of Monty Python and the Holy Grail and see how see how well we can get it uh, run through. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that wraps up this edition of Chat from the Old Cap. Thanks to Rick Cleveland and the UI alumni engagement team. They put this together on behalf of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. To check out these and more UI alumni engagement events and UI Center for Advancement events, go to foriowa.org. You can also go to the UICA's YouTube channel and see past editions of Chat from the Old Cap. Again, thanks to everybody who joined us today. Thanks to Rick Cleveland. Happy holidays, everybody. Go out, be kind, be patient, be good to others, and be good to yourself. Goodbye.